Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. Last class, we developed the definition of a radian, and the radian measure for an angle comes directly from the radius length, from radius length of a circle. So that's our connection between one radian, one radian measured angle versus the radius, the radius of a circle. An angle that measures one radian intercepts an arc on the outside of the circle of exactly one radius length. And so that's the definition of a radian. That's what it is to be a radian. And so an angle of one radian in size intercepts an arc of exactly one radius length in measure. What? An angle of one radian in size intercepts an arc of one radius in length. And so that's what our definition of a radian is. That's what our definition of a radian is. Let's see if we can't get a picture for that. So if we were to go ahead and consider a circle, any size circle, if we took its radius length, and I'll go ahead and show that in blue, kind of like yesterday's activity, and we took that radius length and wrapped it around the outside of the circle, kind of like you wrapped around with a pipe cleaner. One radius length on the outside of the circle and connected that back to the center. The central angle created by definition would measure one radian in size. So an angle of one radian corresponds to an arc of one radius length. The only difference is a radian, right, measures an angle, measures a spin, a rotation, whereas a radius measures a length. And so if this angle intercepts an arc of length one radius, then it equals one radian. We saw to find the number of radians in a, uh, in, in a given angle by considering the number of times the radius fit into a given arc length. And that's what we did uh, towards the end of yesterday's activity as well. All right. How many radians then are in one full rotation of a circle? Well, radians measure rotation, right? But radii, the radius length, measures length. And so if you think back to your circumference formula, the circumference C of a circle is given by 2 pi times r, where r is the radius length of that circle. Then how many radius lengths fit into the entire circle, the entire circumference? 2 pi radius lengths are in the entire arc around the circle called the circumference. Therefore, there's two pi radians of spin in one full circle of rotation. So this two pi tells me there are two pi, there's exactly two pi radians in one full circle of rotation. And I'm going to scooch this down in one full circle of rotation. Why? Because there's two pi radius lengths, right, in one full circumference of the circle. So that's the connection between radians and the, the circle's radius. Awesome. Let's go ahead and use our conversion identities then to complete the following chart. So what I did is I made some space where your work is. I'm going to go ahead and do each of these. And so our one-third revolutions, first we need to go to degrees and then radians exact. So on the right-hand side, I'll put my goal here so that I know where I'm headed. For our 4 pi over 3 radians, we need to go to revolutions and degrees. So I'll go ahead and put my goal over here. We want to go to revolutions once and then degrees. And lastly, for the 210 degrees, we need to go to revolutions and radians. Awesome. So we know where we're we know where we're headed now. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at our chart to get from a third of our evolution to degrees and to radians exact. Right. We could use our knowledge of of the circle and do this just by reasoning. However, I'm going to practice with our identities. Right. As the directions ask, so that we can be comfortable converting from one system of measurement to another. So I'm going to go ahead and start at one third revolutions. And I'm going to head towards degrees. I'll do that by multiplying by an identity, a conversion fraction, whose sole purpose is to get rid of the label I don't want, in this case, revolutions, so I want that on bottom, and move towards the unit I do want. In this case, I want to end up with degrees, so I'll put that on top. If 
by constructing an identity fraction like this, I'll be able to cross out revolutions over revolutions, cancels to one, and I'll be left with the degrees, the label I do want. All right, get ready. So go ahead and tell the class the relationship between degrees and revolutions. There's how many degrees and how many revolutions. What's my identity? Austin? Absolutely. 360 degrees corresponds exactly to one revolution. Cancel out the label I don't want. Revolutions, revolutions. That's the degree measure that I do want. And I multiply straight across. It looks like I can do 1 times 360 divided by 3. And I'm getting 120 degrees. Raise your hand if you already had 120 degrees. 120 degrees. Nice job. Let's fill that in our chart. Great. Let's start over at the beginning, one-third revolutions, and this time, let's go ahead and multiply by a conversion fraction whose sole purpose is to get rid of the label I don't want, revolutions, and end up with the label I do want, in this case, radians. So I'll put radians on top, I'll put revolutions on bottom, and we saw, right, that there were two pi radians and one full rotation around the circle, therefore, in one revolution, there are two pi radians, right? There's two pi radians. And so we'll go ahead and multiply straight across. One times two pi divided by three equals, and this equals two pi over three radians. That would be our exact, right? Our approximate, we can get at the very end by simply entering my radian expression with the pi in my calculator and having it spit out the decimal. So I'll wait and do that all at the end and take a screenshot. Our exact is where we're concentrating on our, our conversion identities. So 2 pi over 3, we can fill that in our chart. Awesome. Let's go ahead and start at 4 pi over 3 radians and go towards revolution. So let's multiply by a conversion fraction. This time I want to get rid of radians, so I'll put that on the bottom. And I want to move towards revolutions. So I'll put that on top. Okay, here's the big deal. Here's the connection, number 14. How many revolutions correspond to how many radians, right? How many revolutions correspond to how many radians? Katie? Uh, one revolution. Absolutely. Thank you. One revolution corresponds exactly to 2 pi radians. When I go to my calculator to evaluate this, however, I notice that there are several quantities on bottom. There's a factor of 3, a factor of 2, a factor of pi. So that I can enter this in my calculator a single time, I'm going to go ahead and put parentheses around that 3 times 2 pi. When I enter my calculator, this will ensure that I'm dividing by that entire quantity as opposed to just dividing by 3 and then multiplying by 2 and pi on top. So let's go ahead and try that out. I'll do 4 pi times 1 divided by, and then parentheses, there's my red left paren, 3 times 2 pi. Close and 0.6666666667. I bet that is math frac. Enter. Voila, that's two-thirds of a revolution. So I get two-thirds of a revolution. And I can fill that in my chart. All right. From four pi over three radians to degrees. And so here we go. Oh, I've got to put my label here. Two-thirds of a revolution. Awesome. Four pi over three radians. Multiply by a conversion fraction. We're going to get rid of radians. So we that on bottom. We're going towards degrees. So I put that on top. Go ahead and tell the class the identity. How many degrees are that correspond to how many radians? Get ready. What's my conversion there? Kelsey? 360 degrees and two pi radians. Absolutely. Thank you. So 360 degrees correspond to two pi radians. Again, I'm going to use parentheses around that bottom quantity to make sure that I divide by each of those things on bottom, two times, three times the two pi, and I get four pi times 360 divided by, open up the denominator, so left paren, three times two pi, close the denominator with the right paren, and 240 degrees. So four pi over three radians corresponds to 240 degrees. By golly, we've got another chart entry. So we need 240 degrees. Get that in our chart. And that makes sense. If a third of a revolution is 120 degrees, then two-thirds of a revolution must be double that, 240 degrees. Twice 2 pi over 3 must be 4 pi over 3 radians. And so these are matching nice. 
All right, let's go ahead and do the last one. That was the trickiest. We want to go from 210 degrees to revolutions and to radians. So let's go ahead and do that last one. 210 degrees, go to Gedra, multiply by a conversion fraction, get rid of degrees, and go to revolutions. Be ready to tell the class the identity. What relates revolutions to degrees? What relates revolutions to degrees? So how many revolutions are how many degrees? Jaden? Awesome, thank you. So we can go ahead and multiply straight across, divide by bottom, and reduce, and then I'm going to max frack it. And so I'll go ahead and get this exact as a fraction fully reduced, simply by doing 210 straight across times 1, divided by quantities on bottom, 360, enter, math, frack, enter, voila, looks like 7 twelfths of a revolution is 210 degrees. So 7 twelfths gets to go on my chart. That's pretty sweet. 7 twelfths, we'll go right here. And we're one to go. We want to get from 210 degrees to radians. So how are we going to do that? And we can do that by multiplying by, you guessed it, a conversion fraction, whose sole purpose is getting rid of degrees and going towards radians. Be ready. What relates radians and degrees? What's my conversion there? What's my conversion there? Allie? Um, two pi radians. Awesome. Good job. Thank you. To keep this exact as a fraction, I will leave the pi out of my entry in the calculator. Once I put a pi into my calculator, right, if there's a single pi, it's irrational. It's not going to be able to change it back into a fraction using the math frac command. So I'll purposely leave that pi out of my entry. I'll do 210 times 2 divided by 360, and then math frac enter and put the pi back in manually on top of my answer fraction. Let's go ahead and see what I mean. So ready? 210 times straight across. 2, but leave out the pi, divided by 360, enter, math, frac, enter, and then put the pi back in on top. So I get 7 pi over 6. That way I can get it exact and fill in that column that I want it. So I'm getting 7 pi over 6. That's pretty sweet. So let's go ahead and see where am I. I'm right here, 7 pi over 6. Awesome. So we've got all of our exact values filled in. And now the only thing that remains is our approximations. For decimal approximations, we'll simply enter our exact radians into my calculator with the pi and see the corresponding, the corresponding decimal uh, approximation. So let's go ahead and fill in that last column. Here we go. 2 pi over 3. 4 pi over 3. And 7 pi over 6. Correspond to 2.09 about radians, 4.19 about radians, and 3.67 about radians. Awesome. Raise your hand if you got the chart complete. Did anybody get the whole chart? Way to go, you guys. Good job. What questions do you have about our conversions now that we've refreshed your memory with those identities? Awesome. Then let's go ahead and take a look at a visual representation of a radian. So last class, we spent time developing the definition of a radian by using a pipe cleaner right? that, that we use to measure a radius length. We wrap that radius length on the outside of my circle and connect it back to the center to construct an angle that measured exactly one radian. Take a look at this graphic. I want you to think back now to our activity. And so if we took a radius length, and swung it around the center, we create a circle. The circle has radius r here, shown in red. Now if we could take that radius length and wrap it around the outside in a curved arc, connecting that back to the center creates a central angle that measures exactly one radian. If we spin around the circle, we've got one radian, two radians. Three radians is a little bit less than half a circle. We know that now to be pi radians. We didn't before, but we do now. So then there must be how many radians in the whole circle? Must be twice that or two pi radians in the full circle, right? You guys see that? So by tracing out my radius lengths along the outside, I can see how we get to two pi radians. Remember that was more than six, right? That was more than six, about 6.28, but we'll use the exact two pi radians. So there's our radius R in red of the circle in blue. The radius length along the outside 
when connected back to the center, creates a central angle that measures, by definition, one radian. Right? One radian. Each radius length around the outside corresponds to another radian of spin on the inside. Total of pi radians corresponds to a half circle of rotation. And there's our conversion identity that we use two pi radians in the full circle. Two, oh, dirty dog. Two pi radians in the full circle of rotation. That's pretty awesome. Great. Let's go ahead and pause the recording now and take care of our homework check, and then we'll resume. Today we're going to investigate how changing the equation to our parent functions, y equals sine of x or y equals cosine of x, affects the appearance of the graph. And so what happens to our sine wave, right, when we have a multiplier, a, some constant a out in front of my parent function, like a times sine of x, what's that going to do to the appearance of the graph? What happens if I have some addition or subtraction by a constant after the parent function, right? Sine of x, close angle input, and then plus or minus some d value after the fact. Next class period, we'll investigate what happens if we have some multiplier inside of my angle input, right? So sine of, and then some constant b times x inside my angle input. Each of these is going to cause a different change in the behavior of my graph, and that's what we're going to nail down in the next two days, okay? Today's activity, we're only going to do the first part of it. So we're going to look at uh, uh, part two, the first transformation, a times sine of x or a times cosine of x. We're going to get a stamp on number six. And then part three investigates the second, the second transformation, y equals sine of x plus d, or y equals cosine of x plus d, some addition or subtraction after the fact. There's two stamps on part three, number 10, number 17. After you got your number 17 stamp, we're going to stop. Okay, we're going to stop, and we're going to begin working on your quiz number two review. After the last group's gotten their number 17 stamp, we'll come back together for closure. But first, before we get going with the activity, and the reason we're going to reference our, our, uh, our Ferris wheel here to start is that part of the activity involves a Ferris wheel model, where you're going to be on a Ferris wheel ride. Everybody, you're going to be starting at the 3 o'clock position, the red line. And so when you get to the Ferris wheel problem, please note that the problem starts, and you're sitting at the red line. So you're sitting kind of at the 3 o'clock on a clock face position before you start spinning. And this way, it'll help you figure out your total height above the ground given that the axle of the Ferris wheel is two units above ground. So the axle of the Ferris wheel is two units above the ground. I've drawn a picture here to help with the picture that's already in there. And you're starting at the red line. That'll be the start location. But first, let's go ahead and add the exact radian measures now to our Ferris wheel model. So everybody, if you could please take out your Ferris wheel model we constructed on day five. We're going to go ahead and add the exact radian equivalent to those special 30 degree angle increments all the way around our unit circle. So everybody find your Ferris wheel, please. On our Ferris wheel, we've already labeled on the white note card outside of my colored Ferris wheel circle, we've labeled the 30 degree increments all the way around the circle for one full rotation. Today, before we begin the activity, because we'll be spinning in part three with our Ferris wheel model, we're going to add the exact radian equivalent. So everybody, let's take a look at our Ferris wheel model. And a good kickoff is, considering my definition of a radian, we saw that the number of radius lengths that fit in a given arc length determine the number of radians that the corresponding central angle measures. In this case, we know that the circumference of a full circle is 2 pi radians. So we can fill that in for free. If we were to spin all the way around the circle, we will have spun through an arc of 2 pi radians of rotation. So, to kick off our party, think, how many radians this must then be in a half circle of rotation? That is 180 degrees. Well, if 2 pi radians represent a full circle of rotation, then how many radians are in a, a half circle? 180 degrees. Morgan? Pi radians. So everybody, we can fill in pi radians for a half circle of rotation, 180 degrees. Well, just like we halved a full circle, two pi radians, to get a half circle of rotation, 180 degrees corresponds exactly to 100 uh, pi radians, we could half that again to get a quarter circle of rotation, 90 degrees of rotation. Well, if a half circle, 180 degrees of rotation is pi radians, then 
pi over 2. Pi divided into 2 would be 90 degrees. So everybody, we get our 90 degree one for free as well. That's pi over 2 radians. Corresponds exactly to 90 degrees. The trickiest one for my blue, for my blue pi over 2 is the 270 degrees. And so let's go ahead and now go around the circle in pi over 2 increments, 90 degree increments. Just like we could count around the circle in quarter circle turns, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. So too could we count around the circle in quarter degree turns, I'm sorry, quarter, quarter turns, but now count in pi over 2 increments. They're the same as 90 degree increments, it's just pi over 2 radians corresponds to 90 degrees. So let's, let's count this out, ready? 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2 would reduce to pi. 3 pi over 2 would be my 270 special. So everybody can add 3 pi over 2 is my 270 degree angle equivalent. And then all the way around 4 pi over 2, right? If I count around in pi over 2 increments, 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and 4 pi over 2. Wait a minute, that reduces. Yes, 4 pi over 2 reduces to 2 pi, so this works. Next, let's focus in on our 60 degree increments. And we'll go ahead and do that in green. So again, let's think, how many radians are in a half circle? Well, 180 degrees is a half circle that corresponds exactly to pi radians. So if I divided my 180 degree half circle into 60 degree increments, I divide my 180 into how many equal pieces? Well, 180 divided by what is 60? And how many equal pieces? Austin? Three equal pieces. And so if I took 180 degrees and divided it in three equal pieces, each piece would measure an equal 60 degree segment or sector. So we're going to divide up pi into three equal pieces. Guess what? 60 degrees corresponds exactly to pi over three. Pi over three is the exact radian equivalent that corresponds to 60 degrees. And now I can count around my circle in 60 degree increments. 60 degrees, 120 degrees, 180 degrees, 240 degrees, 300 degrees, and back to 360 degrees. Now let's do the same thing, right, in 60 degree increments, but let's do it in pi over 3 increments. That's how we'll get all our special 60s. Here we go. 1 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, corresponds with that, 120 degrees. 3 pi over 3, that reduces, we've already got it, right, 3 pi over 3. 4 pi over 3 is 240 degrees. 4 pi over 3. Next 60 degree segment would be 300, that would be 5 pi over 3. And lastly, full circle would be 6 pi over 3. 6 pi over 3 reduces to 2 pi, and so we've done it correctly. Awesome, one to go ladies and gentlemen, let's do that for red. Let's do our 30 degree segments in red. How many equal pieces do I divide 180 degrees into to get 30 degree increments? So what do I divide 180 by to get 30 degree increments? Ian? Um, How many equal pieces, right? How many times does 30 degrees go into eight, uh, 180 degrees? Almost. Six. Six, absolutely. So if I took my 180 degrees and divided it into six equal pieces, each piece would be a 30 degree segment. So let's do the same thing to our pi radians, which is equal to a half circle of rotation. Pi over 6 is going to correspond to each 30 degree segment. We can now count around the circle in not just 30 degree right, increments, but pi over 6 increments. We should fall upon all these other ones now because they're all 30 degrees apart, but they should all reduce and so we can make sure we've done it correctly for both my green special 60s and my blue special 90s. Here we go. 1 pi over 6 is 30 degrees. 2 pi over 6, does that reduce correctly? 2 pi over 6, yes. 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, ah, 5 pi over 6 is this missing 30 degree special in quadrant 2. So 5 pi over 6 would be 150 degrees exactly in radians. Next, 6 pi over 6, does that reduce? 7 pi over 6 is my special 30 degree in quadrant 3. 7 pi over 6 is 210 degrees. 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6, 10 pi over 6, still working, 
11 pi over 6 is my final special 30 degree angle, reference angle off of the horizontal, but now in radians. 11 pi over 6 corresponds to 330 degrees. And one more, 12 pi over 6. Does 12 pi over 6 reduce? Yes, it does, and it reduces to 2 pi. So we win. Victory. We're going to have to go back and forth between degree and radian mode on our graphing calculator in order to complete the activity. So as we work through the activity, we're going to complete the graphs on the extra handout. Everybody find activity four, and then extra handout. Our goal was to have you be able to do these side by side. And so while you're working on your activity, you can have your extra handout out side by side on your, on your desk so you don't have to be flipping back and forth all the way through the pages. We wanted to make two separate things. We need extra handout, and then activity four, it moves. You're going to have these side by side as you work. Our stamps today in group will be part two, number six, part three, number 10, number 17. When you get to 17, stop. This is not homework. Your homework is quiz number two review worksheet. That's your only homework assignment, no book work other than reviewing, right, for your quiz and that worksheet. The quiz next class will not include the graph transformations you're investigating today. You're going to stop at 17, and then your assignment next time, after your turn in the quiz, will be to continue working on your activity. So don't do your activity for homework. Save it, and you'll continue investigating after you turn your quiz in the next class. You have to go back and forth between degree mode versus radian mode. As you go to verify the graphs and construct them, how do you make sure? Well, look at the axis on your graph. Look at the x-axis. If it has pi over 2s or 2 pi over 3s labeled on the scale, that would be an indication that you'd have to be in radian mode. So on your graphing calculator, you hit mode and toggle down to radian to highlight it before pressing enter. If you're working on a graph that has degrees on the scale, then you'd have to go and purposely toggle over to highlight degree and press enter before verifying your graph. You'll have to change the window to match the axes in order to get the same picture. So you'll have to manually change your window. Right now, it looks like I must have been working in degrees. If I have negative 360 to 360, I must be in degrees. <clears throat> I'll have to change that to like negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi or something like that if I go and change the mode to radians. Does that make sense? Awesome. After we get the 17 stamp, we'll come back together for our closure, and then you'll have a little time at the end to work on your quiz number two review. I'll stop the recording now. And Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and take a look at our closure then from day eight. All of you have gotten your, your number six stamp from part two. We know the effect that A has on the graph. So just describe what A does to your graph. How did it change the appearance of your graph, right? What did that value of A do? Nick? Uh, a is the maximum value away, away from the center line, and negative A is the negative value away from the center line. Absolutely. A determines the distance the maximum is back to the center line, or the distance the minimum value is back to the center line. And so A is used to determine the distance. that separates the max and min from the center line. So the distance from the max or min back to the center line. It's the height of that sine wave, above or below the center line. Good. What does D do? to the graph, the appearance of the graph. I know not everybody got their stamp for 10, right, or 17, but you can still describe to me what the value of D does for those of you who got it. So what did D do to your graph? Mandy? Um, it, it makes the graph look um, like it's a line that goes down and it's up and down. It moves the graph up and down, exactly, yes. exactly. D moves the graph up or down, how much? Right. How much did D move the graph up or down? How much did D move the graph up or down? Nathan? Um, by the value of D. Yeah, so D determines your center line. It moves your graph up or down D units, and so basically D is your center line. It moves the graph up or down D units.
it determines the center line of the graph. That equilibrium line, that your function continues to oscillate above and below and above and below, but always returning and passing through. After you have that down, please listen carefully. Next class, day nine, will be your quiz number two. Don't finish the activity. Pause the activity wherever you are. You'll resume the activity after you turn the quiz. You can continue working on the activity. For now, focus your attention to quiz number two, review worksheet. That's what you should do tonight. No book work other than review. I'll save the recording to Moodle. Nice job today.